Okay, so this is the start of chapter nine. Now, something to be said for this chapter is um, we're skipping a bunch of other chapters. So there's an extent to which this chapter presumes that you knew some of the material previous to this chapter. But you're not responsible for it because you didn't do it yet. So there's going to be some aspects of this chapter that are a little bit confusing. Just know that once we cover chapter four, which is the next chapter, things will even make much more sense. And you're not going to be penalized really um, with this chapter nine homework um, in the way that you think you're going to be. So don't worry too much. Um, just you know, kind of listen to my lecture and some of the preparation work I give you um, for aspects of demand and supply. We're going to be talking about demand and supply um, in the next chapter, chapter four, but there's obviously some elements of it here. So we're going to be talking about it a little bit um, right now. So with that said, um, what we've been talking about here is um, free trade. And we, again, have this statement that free trade benefits all, which is great and all, but um, one way we said it based on chapter four was we said that countries specialize where they have a comparative advantage. And they then trade for other goods. And what it does, as a review here, it allows a country, if we're talking about two goods, goods X, quantity of X, quantity of Y, it allows a country let's say like USA, um, that has a production possibilities frontier like this, it allows the country to consume outside of their PPF. And that's how we could say free trade benefits all because all of the people of the USA get to consume outside of their internal production capabilities, which is obviously Good for everyone in the country. Now, what we explore a little bit more in this chapter is the fact that free trade is doesn't always occur, that limits are imposed. And to some extent, what we're trying to do here is highlight ways in which that free trade is um, limited and what the consequences are. So, <laughs> If there was no trade, then there's only going to be a domestic market. So that would mean that um, if we were talking about something like um, the market for um, textbooks, OK, I, we haven't done this yet, so I'm aware of that. I'm going to go slowly. I think all is going to be well. <laughs> Take a breath. Um, I'm going to draw an XY space, meaning an X and Y axis. And I'm going to do quantity of textbooks here. And I'm going to put price of textbooks here. Now, again, we haven't talked about this yet. But let me just demonstrate very quickly and easily some of the basic concepts of demand and supply. Not the details, but just the very basic concepts to drive this discussion. There's going to be two elements that are working in economics together. 
And again, this isn't going to be in the textbook until chapter four. So you're really just going to kind of have to listen to what I'm saying here. Um, and that and those two forces are demand and supply. Demand would be your willingness and ability to buy it. And on the supply side, we're talking about someone having a willingness and ability to sell it. The price leads to the quantity, but there are two quantities that exist. There's a quantity demanded and There's a quantity supplied. Now, if you're demanding it, think of when you're when you're thinking of something being demanded, think of just how you act personally, right? Just with almost any product. If the price is really high, do you want, and, and I'll raise this after I draw this, if the price is very high, let's say well, I don't know, like the textbook in our case was a hundred bucks. Let's say it was like 10 times that. Let's say that the textbook was a thousand dollars. Would you want a lot of those textbooks or none of those textbooks or very, very few of those textbooks? Meaning, would you want to be here or would you want to be here? Would you want to be at A or B as an individual if the price were a thousand? I don't know about you, but as for me, I probably wouldn't want that much of it. And so this would probably be where I'd be. So I'm going to erase this here. Now, what if the price were very low? Let's say that the price was $1. Sorry, I'm just going to make sure this is still recording. Yes. Let's say that the price was $1. Would you want a little or a lot? Which one? Probably a lot. And at this moment, let's just connect the, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> let's just uh, connect the dots here. Now I'm going to draw a straight line. It doesn't have to be a straight line. It could be, it could have somewhat of a curve to it. That that would be fine. Um, you'll notice sometimes that demand curves have sometimes a curve to it. But this is what I just said here. This is a demand curve. It's measuring my willingness and ability to buy the good at particular prices. So it's a relationship. Demand is a relationship that tells us how much I'll buy when the price is a certain price. And it's basically describing that there's an inverse relationship between price and quantity. Sorry, my pen's not working. So for demand, that there is an inverse or opposite relationship between price and quantity. When one goes up, the other one goes down, and vice versa. Now, let's go to supply. Let's say you're the seller. If you're selling a product, would you, if the price were high, want to sell a lot of it or very little of it? 
if the price were high, you probably would want to sell a lot of it. And if the price were very low, you probably wouldn't want to sell that much of it. Connect the dots. And now we've got supply. Now your eyes should be immediately attracted to that point right there. And at that point where the two meet each other, supply and demand, what economists generally say is going on here is what economists would call an equilibrium, which is a good thing. It basically means that the market kind of settles down and that the price is going to be right there that the quantity is going to be right there, and there'd be some number there. How do we know? That, how do we see this around us? Um, you know, if you look for gasoline, um, especially here on the islands, right? We know that just kind of like a Costco price and um, you know a Sam's Club price and a kind of like a, you know and the military gas prices, which are all much lower. But outside of that. Every other gas station has pretty much more or less the same price. Um, on the west side of the island, there's this like weird gas station. Not weird, but it, it's just like out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, well, it's not in the middle of nowhere either. It's actually just, I think it's north of Wyandotte when you're kind of going down Farrington Highway. It's called like Liberty Gas, but the gas price is like extremely low. Well, it's notable in that sense because it is so low. But everywhere else seems to have about the same price. That's an equilibrium price. And it's going to stop sellers and buyers from kind of deviating from that price significantly. Now, with this said, supply, that there's a direct or same direction. Relationship between price and quantity. Okay, so um, with that said, where would the market be if there was no trade? Then we'd simply be in the in that internal market. So no one's going to trade. So then we're going to just say, what do people want for their own textiles, like clothing and whatnot? What are they going to buy on their own? And what are producers going to produce on their own? So with this understanding, here's going to be our equilibrium, the point where the two curves meet each other, demand and supply, giving us a equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity. Now, this is a lot of work to get to this point, but the reason why this is, is somewhat important is because there's a concept here called consumer surplus, and there's a concept here called producer surplus. Let's talk about what each of those are. For consumer surplus, the best way I can describe it It's that you feel like you got a good deal. So during the pandemic, I've been selling stuff on eBay. Not because I'm like hunting for like a way to make more money, but I don't know, I just got like junk sitting around my house. I got time on my hands somewhat. And I'm just selling things. Now the thing that, you know, so I've been doing this since about well, since like April, basically. The thing I've discovered about doing this is that while sometimes I am a buyer of things, most of the time I'm a seller of things. Now, the things that I buy are pretty, pretty odd um, when I do buy something. Like, um, 
Um, oh, I, I felt like I got a great deal, but it wasn't, um, you know. Um, back in the late 90s, now I wasn't buying these things, but lit, back in the late 90s, um, what's that guy? The guy who made, um, like all those, like, um, like Iron Man and like all those things. Was it like Stan Lee or something? Stan Lee made this toy for the Burger King, like kids meal equivalent, but he made it where he made members of the Backstreet Boys into superheroes. <laughs> Dude, I mean, even my description of this, even if you're not like uh, a comic book fan, even if you're not a superhero fan, even if you're not a Backstreet Boy fan, most of those things I am not a fan of. I just think it's just weird and cool that that product was even produced and given to kids. So, of course, I went on eBay and I bought it. And I was able to buy, like, new sealed in the bag um, members of the Backstreet Boys that appear as um, superheroes for, like, one or two dollars a piece. And I was like, Dude, like that's like the best deal ever. So from my perspective of the consumer surplus, if the seller had been able to say to me, right? So I bought it like a buy it now item. But if the seller had been able to say to me, um, what's the maximum amount you would pay? I probably would have been willing to pay up to $10. And I only paid $1 plus shipping. That $9 difference between $10 and $1 is a measurement of me feeling like I got a good deal. Price of Backstreet Boy, quantity of Backstreet Boy. And then let's just make this my demand curve. And I just said, I would have been willing to buy one at $10. Remember, that's what the demand curve measures. It measures my willingness to buy the good at particular prices. I was willing to buy 10, or sorry, I was willing to buy one even at $10. Here's the supply curve. Right. And for the supply curve, right, there's some like weirdo in like Tennessee who's got like a garage full of, you know, Burger King toys. It's like, geez, someone finally bought this thing. Fantastic. I would have been willing to sell it for like 25 cents just to get it out of my garage and give my kids room to, you know, park their bike at night. Now, the price again that it sold for. It was one dollar. But there's an extent to which both the buyer and the seller gained something from this sale. That sale of the first unit. I was willing to pay more, but I got a good deal. I only had to pay one dollar. Seller would have been willing to sell it for less, but they actually got a dollar for the item. They both, everyone feels like they got a good deal. And if we collected this up over like unit two, over unit three, over unit four, over unit five, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to the equilibrium quantity, it's going to generate one area, which is called the consumer surplus. This is going to be all the consumers up to the equilibrium quantity feeling like they got a good deal. Let's add that all up. That's the consumer surplus, CS. Again, producers have a similar feeling here, producer surplus. They also have a feeling of getting a good deal. And we can measure that area at the area above the supply curve up to the equilibrium price. Okay, now with that said,
um, uh, just 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 repeats the fact of the idea that um, economists like free trade deals. We're going to get back to this consumer and producer surplus issue, though, which is what I'm trying to get to. Um, so with this idea that in a market where free trade is occurring, you're going to have consumer surplus area under the demand curve. You're going to have producer surplus area above the supply curve. And it's going to be these areas of these triangles. Then let's talk about what happens when trade is restricted and when trade is allowed. And use this concept of consumer surplus and producer surplus to talk about who wins, who loses when free trade is stopped. And it's important to understand this not only for understanding economics, but it also helps us understand public policy. Right. It doesn't matter what my personal beliefs are in this case, but um, when um, Donald Trump was president, one of his um, um, defining um, economic policies was imposing restrictions on free trade, free, uh, imposing restrictions on free trade with China, imposing restrictions on free trade with parts of Europe imposing free trade um, restrictions even on like Mexico and Canada. And he had an incredibly hard time finding an economist who would agree with him and work with him, not because of the economist's personal beliefs. In fact, most economists um, tend to be Republican or conservative. Um, no, the, the reason why is because this part, right, is that here, 0% um, um, you know, disagree with this idea that free trade deals don't benefit Americans. So it becomes like, why would you want to, um, if you're an economist, why would you want to work for a president who is not helping Americans um, benefit from free trade, right? At least according to this theory. You now, I'm not teaching this chapter to to make you believe or support someone politically, but it helps you understand in general why if someone has a public policy where they want to stop trade with another country, why you might have an incredibly difficult time finding an economist who agrees with you. So to do this, we need to talk about now two different prices existing, a world price and a domestic price. The world price is going to be the equilibrium price if there's free trade. And the domestic price is going to be the equilibrium price if there's only domestic demand and supply. Okay, let's keep going here. So we want to know now, um, how does our domestic price compare to the world price? Because if free trade can exist, then basically the world price is going to dominate. And if your domestic price is higher, then people will buy it from elsewhere in the world. And if your domestic price is cheaper, then not only will you buy your own goods domestically, but you'll buy goods from other, um, other countries will buy their goods from you as well. So the country is, if it's us versus the world, USA versus the world, who has the comparative advantage in producing each good? Is it the US or is it the rest of the world? And if it's the, oh, sorry, and if it's the rest of the world that has the comparative advantage, then we in the United States are going to import that good, mean bringing buy that good from the rest of the world. So, like that's our shoe example, right? Um, Indonesians are good at making shoes. So, um, in the U.S., yes, we have New Balance and and whatever, but um, shoes are very expensive. 
So people aren't going to buy expensive shoes made where New Balance shoes are made. They're going to buy them cheap Nikes from Indonesia. And if the domestic price is less than the world price, then the good is exported. So that would be things like, um, you know, the U.S. makes a lot of um, airplanes. The United States makes lots of legal services. The United States makes lots of movies. These are things where they're good at making these things. And so those things are then produced um, here and sold to the rest of the world. And what happens is that in the act of exporting and importing the products, the price changes. Let's look at how that happens. So um, there's a lot going on in, uh, in this description here, but imagine, um, let's put this, um, let's put this, let's draw a new picture and then come back to this. Okay, let's say this is the market for lumber and this is Canada as the country. So Canada is one of the world's largest um, exporters of lumber. And if we look at this internally, this is the price charged in Canada for lumber. Now, you could also buy lumber even from Hawaii and so there's presumably a world price. And let's say that the world price is higher. Then what happens? Well, Before trade, let's start to make some letters here. Before trade, if you were Canadian, the Canadians had consumer surplus of A, B, and C. And the producer surplus was D, E, and F. And again, that's for Canadians. Before trade, if we're talking about for the world, consumer surplus was A, producer surplus was B, D, and F, and C and E weren't really anywhere. Because with the world price, the price set much higher, the quantity is lower. But now we allow trade to occur. So after trade, the consumer surplus goes back to being A, B, and C. And the producer surplus goes to being D, E, and F. Everyone in the world benefits from having free trade caused by lower lumber prices as P world gets lowered to the Canadian price. And the Canadian price is gonna to start to increase. So it's gonna kind of be somewhere in the middle here. And that's what we're gonna kind of see here now. Consumer surplus. So they use slightly different um, letters here, but the, but the concept is still the same. Um, before trade, A and B was the consumer surplus, C was the producer surplus. A and B together were the consumer surplus, 
C was the producer surplus. D, the level of D was the amount of exports, how much the Canadians could sell to the rest of the world. When trade occurs, the price goes up. So now we're going to lose area B in the consumer surplus. Producers are going to gain B and D. And the surplus is going to grow by D. Now, the reason why this looks a little bit different here is we're talking um, in this case here just about what's going on within that country, um, not um, around the world. So, with that said, again, the exporting country before international trade, the consumer surplus and the producer surplus. is simply going to look like this, right? Consumer surplus area below the demand curve to the price. Producer surplus area above the supply curve to the price. And once international trade occurs, for that exporting country, just that exporting country, which is whatever this country is here, the consumer surplus is going to fall. The producer surplus is going to increase. And there is going to be some positive amount of exports. The reason why the consumer surplus goes down when you trade is because the domestic price goes up a little bit. But certainly one of the primary beneficiaries to um, free trade within a country would be the domestic producers. Because now instead of having just a domestic market, they have a global market to sell their goods. Consumers within that country will pay slightly higher prices for their products, but overall, producers gain so much more from having a global market that in some sense, they should be willing to subsidize or even bribe US con or you know that consumers in that country to not put up a fight because it does benefit them so much. Within the importing country, um, when you import goods from, a, from around the world, consumers generally are going to be benefiting because the price within your country is now going to be falling closer to the world price. You are going to be importing goods, so that's going to have somewhat of an effect on the economy, but consumers are still going to benefit overall because they are going to get these cheaper prices. And you see this here in this graph here, that before trade, consumer surplus is A, that would be the area below this demand curve to the price. Producer surplus, area B and C, that would be the area above the supply curve to the price. After trade, so now it's going to mean that the world price is the price that's going to drive this, and that world price is lower. So now producer surplus is just area C. Consumer surplus is A, B, and D. So consumers are going to benefit from importing uh, the importation of products. Let me see this right here. So overall, when we look at this here, um, is that um, as long as there's trade, there's going to be producers or consumers, whether you're in the importing or exporting country, that are going to benefit from that free trade. Overall, globally, and spread across producers and consumers, trade does in fact make everybody better off.
Now, unfortunately, there's a politics to this. Now, the politics to this are, are more complicated and make even less sense because to some extent it is politics. So the question then becomes one of how is free trade restricted? Well, one way you can do it is by imposing a tax. Um, you can back up until like the before World War One, or World War yeah before World War One, most of the revenue for the federal government came from tariffs, taxes placed on imported goods. Now, why tariffs are imposed is it both raises money for the government, but what it is is it's also an attempt to get the world price, which may have been lower, to raise that price by basically adding the tax to it, to make the force the world price to be higher, thus reducing consumer demand for imported goods because the prices have risen. And this we see right here, that the tariff raises the world price but look what it does. It actually reduces consumer surplus. So it's not just, it's not the case that when something is imported, the producer eats the, eats the taxes. It actually falls on all of us. So again, it doesn't matter. You, don't, you should not care what I believe about the world. But I was a little bit grumpy about tariffs being imposed on European, Canadian, Chinese goods, because it was essentially a, a tax that I was going to have to pay for, which, again, uh, taxes are kind of the responsibility to living in society, but still, you don't want to pay too much in taxes. So... What do tariffs do? Tariffs do all of these bad things. They, well, they, the impact that the tariff has immediately is it raises the price, which in turn, as the price is going up, then the quantity of demand is going in the opposite direction, which would mean that it's falling. The quantity of supply is moving in the same direction, so that would mean it's increasing. And overall, what the tariff does is it helps producers and it hurts consumers. Again, you don't need to agree or um, believe the same way I do. And the point of this course isn't to change your political or um, your elected official beliefs in any way. But I don't like irrationality. I don't like, uh, I don't appreciate, I guess, um, people acting like they know the right economic policies when in fact the policies are having the opposite effect than what they're saying. So in this case, imposing a tariff on China, right? A whole, right, there's a segment of the population then that gets excited about that because they're like, yeah, take that, China, take that, Mexico, take that, Canada, that'll teach you. But it's actually hurting themselves. It's making all of the things they buy from those three countries more expensive. And the producers aren't going to like tell anyone about it because the domestic producers are going to be totally pumped about it because now their Chinese competitor their Canadian competitor, their Mexican competitor, is now selling a more expensive good. That's making my domestically produced good more competitive in price. Okay, I'm just going to skip this slide because we've kind of already talked about this here. But there's other things in that international trade does and why it's a good thing. For one, it increases the variety of the types of goods that we're able to encounter. I mean, think about it. The, the age of hybrid cars was ushered in by like Honda and by Toyota. If we had said back in the 80s, no cars from 
from Japan, right? Then Toyota and Honda might have had to find some place else to be, and we would have been stuck with Ford and Chevy and Chrysler, and they would have kept making gasoline powered cars and they would never go to electric and they would never do those other things and we'd be stuck buying those things so and japanese competition made the american producers of car act more competitively and strategically and eventually you even got to a point where um General Motors and Toyota made some cars together, right? So the Toyota Matrix is just like the Pontiac Vibe, or or I own I used to own a Corolla, like an early two thousands Corolla. Well, it was the same as a Geo Prism, which was like a Chevrolet car. So you can imagine all these kinds of sharing of ideas of GM, General Motors saying, "How do I make a better car?" Well, the Toyota must have know a good way to do it. Let's get that idea, and Toyota saying, "I don't want like." Selling Americans cars is very different than selling the Japanese cars. What do the what does Chevrolet know that we don't? And they would learn from them in selling that car. And that all comes from international trade. No joke. Not funny. Okay. Um, in general, domestic producers um, are not in favor of free trade, and they're not in favor of free trade because they want to protect their profit margins. They want to be able to charge higher prices. So if you're looking for a famous example of this, look for a US company on the internet called Zenith. Zenith at one time made a lot of TVs. Uh, let's see here, I'm gonna just type it in here just to see how many TVs they used to make. Um, at one point, let's see, sorry, I'm just trying to look at this very quickly and see if I can find this. Uh, Sorry, I can't find it. Um, but wow. So At one point, there were three big TV manufacturers in the United States, Zenith, General Electric, and RCA. So those three companies basically split up the entire US market as they were selling in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, as I'm reading this article here, by 1976, Japan had 45% of the American television market. That was triple, meaning it was 15% in 1970. So 19, throughout the 1970s, Zenith, General Electric, and RCA were losing a large amount of their market share to Japan. Now, what did the Japanese bring with in their TVs? Not only did they bring better TVs, right, like longer lasting and perhaps even cheaper TVs, but eventually we know that um, they brought also um, the Japanese, the Koreans, brought flat panel TVs. And so then imagine that you're Zenith and you're like, oh man, Samsung's making all these flat screen TVs, right? And so they get pretty grumpy about it. And so then they say, well, um, right, what are we gonna do? 
um, we could try to make a better TV. We should also, besides just making a better TV, we should try to stop foreign TVs from coming into the United States. So, um, all right, now you might do things like impose a tariff to protect yourself. Now, how do you get a tariff passed if you're a Zenith or any other domestic company? Well, one thing you could do is you could say, hey, um, if you protect Zenith, the television manufacturer, then the factory that we have here in town is going to keep their workers employed. And they're probably going to vote you back into office because they're going to be able to owe their job to you. So one of these is the jobs argument, right? Like protect U.S. jobs. <laughs> and you certainly saw that um, being mentioned. Um, again, I'm not picking on the guy. Uh, I don't want his job. And I'm not sympathetic to him, but I also don't. Um, I'm not defending him either. I'm, I'm not saying I'm opposed or defending him, but right. I mean, part of the argument that um, um, the former president, President Trump, made was that um, by stopping, you know, um, and again, I'm not picking on China, he was picking on China, but by stopping cheap Chinese imports of certain products, it's going to protect American workers, right? And that's that jobs argument when you start to say things like that. Also, when they were, uh, when uh, former President Trump was imposing um, tariffs on Chinese goods, he was also saying, too, that he wanted to stop like 5G telephone technology from being made in China or something like that. I don't know much about phones, but um, part of that reason was there was a national security argument, too. The U.S. should make its cell phone, 4G, 5G, whatever things themselves, rather than relying on another country to produce those goods. So one argument, again, for imposing a trade, a trade restriction would be a jobs argument. One would be to say it makes us a better country. Um, you see this especially too, right? I mean, like we're not going to have our submarines made by our enemies. We're going to make our own submarines and we're going to make our own fighter jets, et cetera, et cetera. Perhaps one of the better arguments that you could make about why it's a good idea to, res to restrict free trade would be you want to give everyone an honest chance at like being competitive, right? So if I wanted to start my own steel company, um, the Russians make incredibly cheap steel. So you might want to say, dude, once Shining starts a steel factory in Hawaii, uh, the Russians are going to come in and they're going to dump all their really cheap steel and Shining's going to have to go out of business. So let's stop that from happening. And let's make, let's impose a tariff on Russian steel, which is exactly what former President Bush, the um, second one, um, did in the early 2000s is he imposed a tariff on, um, on imported um, steel from Russia, um, not only because of the infant industry argument, because there were some kind of small steel manufacturers that were emerging, but as we're going to see in one of these later arguments, because of also the Russians were doing it to put American companies specifically out of business. Um, <laughs> one of the problems, though, with this infant industry argument, as these points kind of point out here, is it's really hard for the government to do this without seeming like they're taking sides. Um, there's also another argument to be made for restricting um, free trade is that um, other countries are cheating. Um, Again, this would have been an argument that former President Trump used against like China, saying that they're cheating, or even that the Canadians were cheating, or the Mexicans were cheating, and we need to impose these huge restrictions to make things more fair. <laughs> and then the last one is also um, related to um, 
you saw it more with the the Trump administration. I'm not trying to be anti. I really am not. Uh, but you did see this a lot. And the reason why I keep referring back to him is um, one of the central defining features of um, former President Trump economic policies all dealt with restricting free trade, which seemed odd to most economists. And it's probably why we're talking about here. But he did also use it as a bargaining chip, right? Saying, we will, to the Chinese or to some other country, you do what you want us, what we want you to do. And if you do it, then we'll go back to having free trade again. And that's more of what um, former President Trump did with Europe. Okay, we don't really, you don't need to care about these things. Okay, so there are free trade agreements. You can read these slides. I'm not going to just stop you. The more popular one being NAFTA. And then we also have the EU, which is... Um, part of this. And then the other example would be um, Brexit. But this is a slightly longer lecture, so I'm just going to end this chapter here.